Vamos dar início aos trabalhos com a conferência da nossa convidada, Rachel Cohen, which I thank you very much for acceding to our invitation to share with us your insight, insightful ideas and experiences. And a nossa colega Teresa Carvalho também ter decidido fazer o comentário desta conferência. We begin this seminar where we intend to reflect on the advances and main challenges, if not obstacles, to the integration of gender studies in higher education in Portugal, with a conference on the role of institutions and policies in promoting their This is precisely the domain, education and teaching, where gender mainstreaming has been diagnosed as the most difficult and resistant. In her book, Butterfly Politics, Changing the World for Women, Catherine McKinnon, from 2009, uh, McKinnon states that in academia, it is not possible to know a subject while maintaining illiteracy on questions of gender and the relation of the status and treatment of the sexes to the sex. These conceptions of, and academic or pedagogical uh, practices rest on the assumption that good science, science is gender neutral and that university life and success is entirely based on merit of a universal model of the subject. It is, in fact, a masculinist epistemology that advantages, advantages white and middle class male academics. So it, was, uh, it has been recognized that it is urgent to change the rules of the game in higher education and that this cannot remain the task of feminist academics acting alone but, most, but must be an uh, institutionally and politically enforced transformation. Transformation. Stronger norms and oversight regimes applicable to all universities are identified as needed for changes already observed in some few specific university contexts. It is also an institutional transformation that moves in a non-linear fashion as long as a long-term and a strategic of power struggle process. That is why we invited our colleagues, Rachel Plaman as speaker and Teresa Carvalho as commentator, for the first panel, given their experience and knowledge of the challenges faced by this institutional transformation as a broader, macro-organized and political process within academic institutions. I want to thank I Rosa. <laughs> I want to thank in particular our colleague Rachel Carmen for being here with us and for bringing us the talk about the role of institutions and policies in the integration of the gender dimension in teaching in higher education curricula. It is a great honor for us to benefit from the experience that you have <coughs> with these topics also in a comparative manner. Rachel Carmen is a researcher from the Internet Interdisciplinary Institute of the Open University of Catalonia in Barcelona, Spain. She integrates the gender and ICT research program, given her extended experience in the context of gender equality in research and innovation. Her current research interests include gender and science, specifically looking at the implementation of gender equality plans. She has participated in uh, several European projects, FP7 and uh, H2020, on gender and science, uh, developing <coughs> tools for the evaluation and the change of practices, as well as tools for designing, implementing and evaluating equality plans, contributing to develop a framework for, for promoting uh, gender equality in research and innovation. Today she will talk us about the main conclusions of E40, 
project that uh, produced an evaluation framework based on case studies of three policy processes in Spain and Austria to integrate gender dimension in teaching, research content, and knowledge in technological transfer. She also has a lot of experience developing communities of practice for gender in research and innovation in Europe and Latin America. She has published uh, several articles in a wide range of social science journals as well as book chapters. She co-authors with Angela Wroblewski a very recent and uh, insightful book on the overcoming the challenge of structural change in research organizations. A reflexive approach to gender equality published in 2022 where they, uh, where they focus on research organizations and their implicit norms, standards, institutional practices and power relations. Currently she leads the Horizon 2020 project INSPIRE, European Center for Excellence for, Excellence for Inclusive, aimed at providing uh, sought leadership and direction in the design, implementation, and evaluation of inclusive gender equality plans from an intersectional perspective across Europe. Teresa Carvalho is a dear colleague, graduated here in, Port in Coimbra, in sociology. She is an assistant professor at the University of Aveiro in Portugal uh, and senior researcher and member of the board at uh, the Center for Research in Higher Education Policies, CIPS. She directs the PhD program in public policies and the master program in public administration and management. She is the director of the research network WEM, Women in Higher Education Management and has been for two years a member of the European um, Sociological Association, a <coughs> member of the Executive Committee as chair. Since 2013, she was the chair of the European Sociological Association Research Network on Professions and a member of the Executive Board of the International Sociological Association Research Committee on Professional Groups. She has developed research and published her work in new public management, sociology of professions, gender and academic careers. Recently, she coordinated the project Change, Challenging Gender Inequality in Science and Research, financed by the Horizon 2020, to uh, increase the presence of women in middle management positions in universities. In this context, she started a community of practices with academics from several higher education institutions in Portugal. And I challenge you to um, take advantage of this meeting to enlarge the number of these of the members of the community. <laughs> it's oh, always an opportunity. <laughs> so finally, <laughs> the floor is yours. <laughs> Well, yeah, thank you very much. Thanks very much to Virginia Ferreira and to the Engender team to invite me here to speak a little bit about the role of institutions and policies to integrate the gender dimension in teaching and higher education. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. I don't need to say anything more about um, my experience and where I'm based. So I'm going to speak a little bit today about I'll put into context the policy framework of integrating the gender dimension in higher education and curricula at the European level. Uh, then we'll take a quick look at the Equity project and I'll explain some of the case study work that we were involved with that we managed at the Open University of Catalonia. And really I'm going to present the results of an article that we published in 2022, which is here. Um, two of the case studies. This, this article is actually based on a comparison of three case studies. But we're going to concentrate today on, on analysing two of the case studies which are more relevant for uh, higher education. So this is uh, the experience of Catalan University integrating the gender dimension into higher education curricula. And also the uh, national policy experience of Austria 
um, where they've integrated performance agreements between national government and universities. And we're going to look at the um, design, implementation, and the outcomes and impact of these two case studies because we carried out a comparative uh, case study approach. And I think it's quite interesting to look at the different concepts that have come up. And then I'll briefly reflect on some of the conclusions. So in terms of the policy framework, um, as you're all probably aware, gender equality and gender mainstreaming is one of the six European research area priorities and um, this priority has really been divided into three different objectives. So one is really trying to encourage more women to go into research careers. Um, the second objective is really looking at promoting women in terms of leadership and decision making. And the third um, objective is really integrating the gender dimension into research content and, and teaching. And it's this, this objective that we're going to speak about today. And it's this objective really where the least progress has been made. I mean, this has been recognised by an interim evaluation of the Horizon 2020 research programme, where they recognised um, how fewer funded proposals um, that expected actually incorporated the sex and gender analysis. And it was recognised how this, this came down to a lack of knowledge, a lack of know-how and a lack of training. This was one of the, the areas that explained the lack of progress made in this objective. It was also recognised how um, there was a tendency to, come to, to, to mix up the idea of gender balance in research teams and pushing forward with actual what integrating the gender dimension in the actual content and knowledge actually means. And so I'm going to speak a little bit about um, the results of a project that we were involved with, which was the Efforty project. And the Efforty project was um, a, it was a Horizon 2020 project funded under the research programme Science with and for Society. It was a three-year project, so it ran from 2016 to 2019, and it had a budget of €2 million Euros with seven different international partners. Um, it was led by Susanna Bora from, from Fraunhofer EC, and the main aim of FIT was really to try and develop an analytical framework to really systemise the knowledge on gender equality policies in research and innovation. Um, so we provide a sophisticated but practical tool so different institutions, different policy makers could really begin to evaluate the impact of gender equality policies in research and innovation and also to really try and provide some empirical evidence for the positive effects of gender equality. Now it was innovative because it didn't just look at in terms of effects on in terms of gender equality, i.e. in terms of maybe um, representation of men and women in, 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 in teams but, or in terms of the content of, of research but it also looked at the positive effects in terms of the research and innovation outcomes. So this was quite innovative in, in this field. Um, so we can see here, this was the, the, the overall structure of efforty. It was very complex and because it wanted to track different interventions at different levels, so interventions at the individual level, but also interventions at the institutional level, as well as policy level institution, policy level interventions and legislative measures. So it's very complex. So as I've already said, it really had this focus on these three different levels, these three different objectives of the era priority, so more women in research and innovation, uh, women at leadership positions, but also the integration of the gender dimension in research content and curricula. And this was looked at in terms of both pillars, in terms of impact on gender equality as well as impact in terms of the outputs of research. So research quality, research productivity, uh, responsible research and innovation as well. So it was, it was very complex. 
the uh, conceptual framework. So, um, yeah, I'm going to speak a little bit about the, the empirical findings of the case studies that we were uh, responsible for at the Open University of Catalonia. Uh, this is the article on which the, the presentation is based. So, it's open access. So, if anybody wants more information, it's worth looking at here. So, at the Open University of Catalonia, we were responsible for managing all the case studies. We didn't implement all the case studies, but we had to develop a framework so that we could compare these different case studies. Um, this was very difficult because obviously the, the case studies were operating at all these very different levels. So it was very, how can you compare an apple with a pear, for example? So um, we looked at in the two case studies that we're going to look at today, for example, we've got one of a national level scope, we've got one at an institutional level scope. They have similar kind of objectives and the target sector is, is the same, so it's higher education sector. Um, but we had to operationalise you know, the complexity of, of taking into account all these different level programmes um, with, with this, this framework. So, we decided to focus on three main elements of, of these um, public policy, well, these interventions. So the design of the intervention, the implementation of the inter intervention, as well as the outcomes and the impacts. So this was the main framework for developing all the different case studies. So going back to integrating the gender dimension in, in, into education. So, so what do we mean by this? Um, well, integrating the gender dimension to education refers to fostering gender knowledge in all different areas. Um, and it can include measures to mainstream gender issues into the higher education curriculum to enhance awareness and sensitivity, as well as more specific initiatives to foster um, specific gender programmes. So, for example, research training by creating uh, collaboration between different actors to really try and establish new content in teaching and learning methods. So in terms of activities, um, it can be mainstream gender awareness throughout all the curricula, um, developing new knowledge and training methods specifically, uh, for example, where sex and gender analysis is of special re relevance, but also it's um, important to recognise how collecting and publishing research that successfully integrates sex and sex and, and gender perspectives, how that this can then feed back into um, teaching and higher education curricula. So we're also talking about research content. So, um, in terms of the two case studies, I think these case studies are very interesting because they highlight this relationship between the policy level as well as the institutional level. You cannot just look at one of the levels without looking at the other level. These things are always very interrelated. So for example, the Catalan University, um, this was a real pioneer in introducing the gender dimension in education and research. Um, it was it's a pioneer in terms of it was one of the first universities in Spain to have a gender quality plan. It was one of the first universities in Spain to have a, an equality unit where before, the, before this was required by national government. Um, and it's also operating within a strong legal framework. So for example, the 2015 Catalan law for effective equality between men and women states that universities must mainstream gender perspective. And this is also strengthened by the national um, accreditation quality um, agency in, in Catalonia who require all courses to have a gender perspective for accreditation. This is now. Um, but when, this, when, when the Catalan University started this work, this, this, this requirement wasn't there. And in terms of the performance agreements in Austria, now this is interesting because um, performance agreements are signed between national ministry in, in Austria and each individual university. And this, these agreements are the basis from which funding is given to the universities. 
Now, for 2016 and 2018, it was the first time that goals were set for the gender dimension. So, so this was included into uh, these performance agreements. And targets for gender, gender dimension, these included, for example, implementing a networking platform for researchers and practitioners to share gender-specific research findings, as well as application possibilities. Um, that they had to promote awards for gender research, as well as projects that integrated the gender dimension into curriculum and research and innovation. So two very, very different case studies. But what's very interesting is when we look at the findings of these two very different case studies, we can see lots of similarities. Um, so as I said, we're going to talk about the findings in terms of the design of the intervention, the implementation of the intervention, and the outcomes and the impact. So um, the three main um, issues when talking about the design of the intervention uh, concern the resources, how, you know, were the objectives realistic given the amount of resources allocated to this intervention? For example, in the Catalan University, um, the, the observatory was given €60,000 a year. But bear in mind, the university has 80 different study plans. So how do you then really effectively integrate the gender dimension in each of these different study plans when you think maybe university professors don't have the knowledge and the competences to really take this forward. So this was one of the stumbling blocks. And in terms of resources for the performance agreements, while the performance agreements were dependent on including the gender dimension in the agreement, when the money was given from the National Ministry to the universities, um, there was no money allocated to push forward the gender dimension in, research, in teaching or research and innovation. So it became very difficult to then implement some activities that would take this forward. And the lack of direct incentives also meant that um, there was a lack of direct incentives whilst um, the lack of ring fence funding meant that it was very difficult to have a standardised monitoring of the gender dimension throughout all the universities because the people, uh, universities responded to this in different ways. Um, in terms of the design of, 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 the, the inter, of the birth interventions, you know the legal status of, of both of these interventions meant that it became difficult to, um, the lack of sanctions meant that it became very difficult to, to implement. So for example, in gender equality plans, this means if an action is carried out or not, this becomes dependent on, on often the goodwill and the voluntary work of a lot of people working within the institution. Um, and if it doesn't happen, for whatever reason, there are, there are no real consequences. And in terms of the performance agreements, again it was recognised that the performance agreements do not have the status of a, a legal contract. So anything that was written down in the performance agreements to take forward the gender dimension for them to receive the funding, if it didn't happen, nothing, nothing happened. Uh, it, it, was, it was not problematic. <coughs> uh, the other interesting issue is the, you know, in terms of the design of the intervention, you know, what concept of gen the gender dimension was really operationalised throughout the programme. So for example, in Catalan University, it was um, interesting because it became, they mainstreamed it um, as one of the five basic competences. Um, so that meant every student who graduated from this university um, had to have a basic competence of, of the gender dimension. So this was a very, this was quite a clever way to really uh, mainstream concept within the university. And within the performance agreements, well obviously because this covers Austria, so there are lots of different universities and there, there was a big heterogeneity within the universities and how they operationalised uh, integrating the gender dimension into um, higher education. 
So in terms of um, implementation, um, both, both, um, both case studies um, <coughs> highlighted how top level commitment was very, was very important. There's been lots of research that's been done on this that, have, that has recognised the, the importance of top level commitment from the institutions who want to implement gender equality um, policies and measures. So in the Catalan University, the rector and the top management were really behind and they were pushing and pushing um, to integrate the gender dimension within tertiary education. Uh, they also designated one person per faculty who would be responsible for, for, for their faculty for implementing uh, the gender equality, the different measures. And in the performance agreement, it was very interesting because it was seen, it was the other way around. So, um, it was seen as a steering instrument to secure the top level commitment within the institution. Institutions who previously had not been that bothered about uh, gender equality saw that they had to become bothered about it. And so this was a useful policy push for, for securing top level commitment in the institutions. Um, in terms of implementation as well, something that was, was seen to be very important was you know, central coordination of, of one unit, but with distributed responsibility. So, so combining both efforts. So having one kind of unit where the, there was expertise, where there was gender competence, but then spreading this knowledge throughout the different study programmes. So mainstreaming this. This was seen to be uh, a very useful approach. And in terms of, of in, in the performance agreement, um, case study, one of the, we, within this case study we looked at three different institutions more in depth and the institution that had the strongest, if you like, approach for integrating the gender dimension tertiary education, it, it, it encompassed all of these different activities, so it had the gender studies and teaching of other disciplines, it had gender critical teaching throughout all programmes, uh, it also had optional modules, which were gender <coughs> science and gender studies, and it provided an extension curriculum of gender studies. Now this was interesting because they actually gave credits, extra credits, for this, um, for this module, and this, this meant that it was a lot of people you know, took on this, this module, and also provided a mandatory course. Um, implementation was also facilitated, a, a good implementation of these, these gender equality interventions um, was really facilitated by having the gender competence, so having you know, the know-how in how to integrate the gender dimension, uh, so training, so for example in the university, the, the, the observatory, they actually provide training to the heads of the different study programmes and to lecturers. In, in terms of content, but also in terms of methodology. Um, and it was seen that the lack of status of gender studies really hindered the implementation, both in the Catalan University and the performance agreements. <clears throat> so, for example, um, there was a lack of visibility of the research that was being carried out in gender studies. Um, and also, you know, this idea of freedom of academic staff. So, for example, you had some, um, some lecturers, some professors um, that couldn't see the relevance of integrating the gender dimension, for example, in mathematics or in physics. How, you know, why is that relevant for me? I have the academic freedom to choose how this course will be taught. So, it's <coughs> to hinder the implementation of, of integrating the gender dimension in those areas. And also how gender studies is not a, re a regular subject in the essay classification, so this hindered the allocation of resources and meant, meant it became more difficult to vis vi visualise some of the outputs of, of the work that's been done in, the, in this field because money wasn't allocated to disseminate. And in terms of outcomes and impact, so we can see that across these case studies, um, there was an increased awareness and interest in, in gender. This was very interesting in the performance agreements because it was, this was recognised that this happened at all levels in the university hierarchies. 
And there was also a, a spillover to the private sector because as um, students became more interested in, in integrating the gender dimension, when they leave and got jobs in the private sector, this had knock-on effects. So this is something to be recognised. And um, in terms of increased gender competence, um, again, as students developed the competences in different areas, they then went on to use this in, in their future careers, wherever that might may be. And one interesting finding was not only um, were outcomes and impacts seen in terms of, of, of research and innovation, um, but also this was seen to have a knock-on effect in terms of gender representation. So, for example, in, in the Catalan University, the second gender equality plan uh, spoke about the impacts and the outcomes in terms of recent research content. But in the next uh, gender equality plan, it went back to institutional change and this idea of inclusive excellence. You know, the, the university was really trying to reframe all of these um, achievements made in terms of inclusive excellence. Um, in terms of the, the performance agreements, it was very interesting because um, it was found that the increased awareness and support of gender equality throughout all hierarchies in the universities meant that implementing uh, these kinds of pol policies and measures became easier. So there was more support for non-discrimination policies within the universities at different hierarchical levels. And also there was more support for, for, for female students. So in terms of outcomes and impact, um, it was recognised at the Catalan University that there was an improved accreditation process. So the actual process of, of accrediting um, the different qualifications from each university was actually better, given that it now integrated the, the, the gender dimensions in the evaluation criteria. And in terms of the performance agreements, it was seen that the actual research that was produced, it was more, there was much more interdisciplinary research, and there was more gender sensitive research being taken forward, and also um, more sort of use inspired research and innovation projects. So the conclusions. Um, we, we felt that the FAT framework was really useful to really operationalise complexity. So it, um, it was a simple way to really try and look at these, all these complex interactions of, of the different policy levels with the institutional levels, with the design, the implementation, the outcomes and the impact of the different measures. So in terms of design, you know, the concept, how the concept of, of, of gender equality, gender mainstreaming, how this operat is operationalised, that really matters. Um, in terms of implementation, where well, gender competence is key. And in terms of outcomes and impacts, we, we think, you know, the research demonstrated that, that the gender equality initiatives led to a more, um, a better inclusive way of doing teaching and doing science. So, um, yeah, we're now, thanks very much um, for giving me the opportunity to speak a little bit about the, the research that we've carried out. But we're now embarking on a new project, which is the European Centre for Excellence on the Use of Gender Equality, Research and Innovation. And we've actually got a task at the Open University of Catalonia to take forward the case studies. We've got 35, ca <coughs> 35 uh, case studies planned um, to really try and identify some more of the sort of success factors, what makes institutional change sustainable, and yeah, we hope to sort of carry on some of the work that we've been doing here. Okay. So. very much for the invitation and for this uh, so detailed this invitation to work again. It's always a pleasure to come back to this house and to be able to discuss these topics with the whole And it was also a, a pleasure to listen to the work of the, the, the racial government. Uh, <coughs> Also, it's good also to know 
about all these uh, results and we had the opportunity to somehow comment whatever it is <laughs> or uh, to change to exchange some ideas with you about this. Uh, so I, I would like to probably to start uh, with a positive note. I think it's also important when we talk about these uh, issues to have a, a, a positive tone. So I think it is important to highlight how higher education institutions have been in fact key actors and a positive force in the long journey to gender equality. And this is evidence uh, first and foremost with the increasing enrollment of female students and also with the recruitment of female staff. So on this side, higher education institutions were able to uh, increase the number of women with agency over their lives and also to increase the number of women in positions of power. The second positive aspect of higher education institutions, and I go back again to the first uh, speech of Virginia in the beginning, when she talked about the inclusion of the knowledge about gender in Portugal, uh, is exactly about knowledge production. Without higher education institutions, uh, we would not be able to have uh, the research that has in fact exposed the ways in which girls and women are di discriminated against. So in fact, higher education institutions are good institutions <laughs> and we need to praise them. However, as we know, uh, higher education <laughs> institutions, <laughs> there's always a <laughs> <laughs> We know that uh, they uh, tend to produce and reproduce the knowledge elites and also the social inequalities. And that's why we are here discussing. Um, actually, we all know where is this, the main points of these inequalities, specifically concerning gender in higher education institutions. And Rachel has talked about some uh, specific points that some institutions have tried to develop to overcome that. So, they, as she uh, clearly <coughs> stated in, in a very uh, useful way, we have different levels of analysis and different uh, levels that interconnect with each other and the political level is a very important one. Probably we wouldn't be here talking about all this if we were not, we all, uh, and our higher education institutions, our political systems, were not influenced by the European policies. So we have been, in fact, in the last years having this Europeanization of uh, uh, higher education policies that include also some positive policies first as affirmative actions and then in a mainstreaming perspective about gender in higher education. The most recent is this requirement from the Horizon uh, Europe to have gender equality plans as an eligibility criteria to apply for funding. So this uh, was the main uh, term to uh, somehow make our higher education institutions start thinking seriously about this and also to integrate the gender dimension in research and innovation has become uh, a content uh, requirement by default for these applications also. So, uh, taking this, what has been done? So all the institutions have been trying to create these gender equality uh, plans. And what is uh, interesting is that when they have started these plans, we have actually noticed that there is a research to practice gap or a knowledge to action gap between gender in science and research projects or recommendations and their actual implementation. 
So this kind of studies as Rachel presented now, we have in fact, or as Virginia talked in the beginning, we have in fact a lot of knowledge produced about uh, gender in higher education institutions, the gender relations, the power relations based on gender, but a lot of research also about, uh, on the um, actions that uh, policies and institutions have been implementing, but then there is uh, uh, an op almost an obstacle <laughs> to uh, see them in uh, practices in the institutions. So in many, um, as Virginia referred previously, in many uh, places we have started to create these communities of practices that we have also tried in, in Portugal as a way to uh, integrate the knowledge we are producing and trying also to implement it in, in our institutions. And in our specific case, we have also created the, this figure of the transfer agent, what we call the transfer agent. And it is related also with what Rachel was uh, talking for the Catalonia University about these key persons that they have in each uh, faculty to be able to implement uh, the actions that they were uh, developing. So this is uh, quite uh, relevant and quite interesting, but it seems to uh, always be less than enough, less than we need to actually being successful. As you know, the, and has been referred previously, this uh, new requirement for gender equality plans have uh, at least uh, five key areas to be uh, targeted in these plans. And one is the, the one that we are discussing in this uh, session, is integration of the gender dimension into research and teaching context. And this is exactly one of the most difficult, <laughs> as we are all uh, somehow uh, saying. And this made me reflect on this. Why is it so difficult to include the gender dimension in teaching and in research? And one of my main hypotheses is that this emphasis on gender in teaching and research may translate a completely different paradigm of what higher education institutions and universities are doing and about their mission in society. Uh, if we focus, for instance, in teaching, as Virginia said before, it's always good to be after you, <laughs> I'm always saying, as previously mentioned, <laughs> we have been influenced by this neoliberal uh, tendencies that have actually uh, implemented a managerialist ideology within higher education institutions. And in this perspective, the emphasis on teaching has been a lot in the relevance of teaching and learning for the employability. And on uh, hard skills, on the technical skills, so in teaching, we have been putting the emphasis on creating good employees. When we talk about integrating gender in teaching, we are going into another paradigm. We are emphasizing a human and social perspective of universities and higher education institutions. What we are saying is that we need to put emphasis in the relevance of teaching and learning for creating and disseminating professional norms and values. And uh, this is highly important and we have seen this, unfortunately, in the last time in Portugal, for instance, with the judges' decisions in many <laughs> uh, situations. So we are putting the emphasis on soft skills and actually, higher education institutions are starting to put this focus on soft skills, but they don't include usually the gender competences as an important skill for um, the students. So what we are actually 
proposing is the substitution of teaching to and learning to produce good employees for the teaching and learning to produce good citizens. And that's probably why the change is so difficult. The same happens with the research. Within a managerialistic perspective, the emphasis in the relevance of research for the economic development is uh, the tendency that we have been assisting is to align higher education with the economy and the labor market as well as the establishment of close interactions or partnerships with the industry. Well known, uh, the, the startups and all this uh, kind of research more applied and more useful for society. In this new perspective, by including gender, we are also proposing a more human and social perspective of higher education institutions that relies more on the civic and social engagement. So the main concern is now with co-creating knowledge with and for society and primarily with social impact. So research that actually uh, may promote the improvement of society and of our uh, main social values. So I think this uh, paper that uh, Rachel presented is a really useful tool for us to think how to do this, how to promote this change, and uh, particularly how to um, uh, assure that this will be a sustainable change. Actually, if we look at our higher education institutions, probably in uh, all over Europe, we have gender equality plans probably now in all of them, <laughs> or in almost all of them. What does this mean? Are we really changing the higher education institutions or not? And I think for this, we need to uh, rethink uh, also the uh, policy process as a creative rather than a reactive process. I mean, we uh, need to be always on a loop, on a feedback, uh, analyzing, as Rachel did with the, her colleagues, analyzing what's uh, going on in our institutions if we are not only changing uh, according to the rules, just to check the boxes without actually having a sustainable change for the future. So, what uh, it seems to be needed according to these uh, reflections and this empirical study is to uh, have uh, both excellent policy analysis and ex post analysis. What does this mean? We need to look both at the previous um, perspective of the institutions, why are institutions changing, so what make them change, and then what are the results of this change. And for this, I think, it is quite important to try to close this gap between research and practices and to close this gap at all levels. And how can we do this? I think this uh, paper from Rachel inspires us to think a little bit more about this. I think the gender experts are essential in all these levels and in all these processes both in excellent and exposed analysis, both at political level, and here a racial talk, for instance, about the national regulations and agencies that we have heard also uh, previously, it is always good to be, <laughs> not to be the first one, I, I'm referring to the vice rector of the, the university when you said that our the foundation for national science, we need to start all over again because we simply change 
the board of the association. So, uh, what, if we had an office with a gender expert, we probably wouldn't need to start all over again. And this is the same for the importance of the national agencies for quality. If we already have an office with gender experts in our national agencies, if all the guidelines we have to, for the degrees to comply with have in the specific indicators for using uh, gender or include gender dimension in teaching and research, probably this would be more sustainable in the long term. The same is true for the institutional level. We need also in our institutions to have gender experts to design and implement the gender equality plans and to be able to follow them uh, in the future, <coughs> namely in these communities of, uh, by including these gender experts in this community of practices. And probably also highly important, as Rachel, Rachel <laughs> pointed out, and um, most of the literature has also pointed, we really need to have at the individual level within our institutions institutional leaders with gender competencies. And for that, we need to start with including gender in teaching and in research. And these are mainly my uh, notes or my comments to this interesting presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.